Welcome everyone on behalf of the Switch for Good team and our panelists. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of your afternoon with us. My name is Christian Chamberlain. I'm the president of Effect Partners and a longtime fierce ally of Switch for Good. Uh, as quoted in the introduction to this powerful new report, we must adapt question and look with a naive eye on the possibility of why something is or isn't. Now, I would guess that many of you here today have indeed spent a fair amount of time questioning the why behind dairy and its bloated role among our community of athletes. But judging by the overwhelming response to this rally, it is so very clear that you are hungry for exactly this type of am ammunition. Indeed, that's why we called this a rally in the first place, because we all know that whether you have been dairy free for your whole life or today is day one in that journey, we need to continue supporting each other and keep this fight as vibrant and invisible as possible. Now, I don't know about you, but if there is a food category, food category that deserves both our scorn and scrutiny more than dairy, I just struggle to understand what it might be. I happen to be moderating uh, this great session today from Minneapolis, an epicenter for dairy farming, marketing, distribution, and not so proudly neighbors to America's dairy land itself, Wisconsin. And while that dairy legacy is proudly marketed here on everything from license plates to butter carvings at the state fair, it's always kind of striking to me that they happen to leave out some very simple facts, like dairy is the single largest, most subsidized food product in the country today, that it makes most of us sick, and that it's been linked to everything from asthma to breast cancer. You know, from the day they switched for good mission started three years ago, two words have really been consistently used to navigate its course, truth and justice. And with the release of the Dairy Does a Body Bad report, Switch for Good has once again delivered powerful doses of exactly that. Now, for those of you who didn't spend your last days of summer poring over the nearly 50 page report, let me break some things down for you. Its intent is to really look at that, look with that naive eye towards all of the claims made by the milk industry, specifically regarding health and athletic performance. It's really a tour de force covering everything from dairy's negative effect on athletic performance to its history of exploiting and targeting athletes, its cozy relationship between the US government and the dairy industry, and the industry's kind of uh, uh, disproportionate targeting and sickening of people of color. Now the report, the report itself took nearly a year to compile it. It includes 300 specific citations backing up it's many compelling claims and features contributions from more than a dozen highly regarded medical professionals, several of whom uh, we're lucky enough to have with us today. In fact, I'm gonna steal another quote from the report. Uh, if there's one thing an athlete needs most, it's the ability to take a good deep breath. So join me in taking that big deep breath together as we've got a lot to get through here in this hour. So first up on our panel is the wise man I've just quoted. Dr. James Loomis. Uh, Dr. Loomis is an internal medicine physician and the current medical director at Bernard Medical Center in DC. He has served as a team internist for the St. Louis Rams and Cardinals, winning both a Super Bowl and World Series ring. He is also the tour physician for the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. I'm not sure if they have a championship ring, but I think that's still pretty cool as well. <laughs> Uh, next up is Dr. Angie Sadecki. Uh, Dr. Sadecki is a gastroenterologist, uh, which she is board certified in as well as internal medicine. She's an author and expert on the impact um, of diet on the gut microbiota and health. Also joining us is James Marin, a registered dietitian on, and environmental nutritionist who specializes in diabetes, autoimmune diets, gastrointestinal treatments, and pediatric nutrition. Uh, one specific call out uh, that I think you all might be interested in, Dr. Sadecki and James are also part of the founding team that has opened up the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine. Uh, this is an amazing organization. Their mission is to treat and prevent and reverse disease using an approach that combines both plant-based nutrition and evidence-based medicine. Uh, you can check their practice out at iopbm.com 
And I would imagine that will show up in the chat field here shortly. Again, that's iopbm.com. And finally, it is always my honor to introduce my dear friend and the founder and executive director of Switch for Good, Dotsie Bosch. Uh, Dotsie is the ultimate truth warrior. As many of you know, she's a performer, professional cyclist. Um, she has both uh, an Olympic medalist as well as a multiple USA national champion and Pan American champion. And oh, by the way, also a former world record holder. I can I pretty much guarantee that you all came here to hear from them as opposed to me today. So a couple few uh, housekeeping things and then I'm gonna get out of the way. Uh, each one of our panelists will shortly give their own uh, perspectives about the report itself. And then we are hoping for a very robust Q&A session to follow shortly after that. Uh, Dotsie, the floor is very much yours. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Gosh, welcome everyone. As Chris mentioned, this report has been a long time coming and it is not without the magnificent efforts of multiple PhDs, MDs and dietitian, and of course everyone here at Switch for Good. I'm so grateful you are all here and I'm so grateful for this awesome turnout. I know over 200 of you registered. Every one of you is either taking time away today from work or family or maybe even a workout to join us. So I just wanna say thank you so much for coming and I really believe that this discussion will be well worth your while. So we've got three incredible medical experts waiting to speak as you know, so I'm gonna leave the science to them. And what I really wanna press upon you is our why. Nothing like this report has ever been published. The vast majority of the professional and amateur sports world still believes that dairy does a body good. And I simply can't stand that. The athletes training under the US Olympic Committee are inundated with milk marketing, not science. And I was one of those athletes as I was leading into the 2012 Olympic Games. I felt isolated and unsupported and trying to figure out on my own how to recover as an elite athlete without cow's milk. And dairy's marketing machine trickles all the way down to high school athletes, as some public school athletic programs are even sponsored by Built With Chocolate Milk. There are no disclaimers on dairy's advertising, warning people that consuming dairy will also cause inflammation and digestive issues, inhibit breathing and blood flow, and ultimately slow recovery. No warning that 70% of you are intolerant to even digesting the lactose in milk, and will probably experience bloating, stomach cramping, itchy skin rashes, and possibly severe constipation or diarrhea. Athletes need to know everything that comes with a glass of milk, and so do you. And the detriments far outweigh any positives. And Chris, since you gave a couple of your favorite lines in the report, I'm gonna do the same. In the section of the report that questions whether chocolate milk is the ultimate recovery beverage, it says, it must be stated that people do not consume human breast milk throughout life, nor is human breast milk considered to be a sports nutrition beverage. Our Dairy Does a Body Bad report is combating milk and dairy marketing with science, 322 citations to be exact. We've gone the flashy TV advertising route too, but with 100 years of promotion under its belt and a $90 million marketing budget last year alone, the dairy industry has a bit more of a wingspan, shall we say, than we do in that area. Many of you may be familiar with the national commercial that launched us, launched Switch for Good in 2018. It was supposed to air during the closing ceremonies of the Olympic Winter Games, but once the industry heard of it, they convinced NBC to pull the commercial without notifying us first. We had paid for that commercial, but it was ripped right out from under us without a word. That's the power we're up against, and we're going to keep fighting our collective dairy-free voice will be heard. Now, after this exclusive sneak peek at the report to all of you wonderful people, we're gonna get this report in the hands of over 500 college athletic directors, professional sports teams, physicians offices in the fields of oncology, gastroenterology, and gynecology, and out to the global media. And we're going to follow up and make sure they read it. Here's where you come in though. You can help us by sending this report along to friends, family members, coworkers, workout buddies, and even your own alma mater. So right now, before we dive in any deeper, I'm gonna challenge you. I'm gonna challenge you to think of just two people that you can definitely send this report to. Just two. You got them? Okay, 
Awesome. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. Thank you so much, Dotsie. Um, let's keep this going. Uh, Dr. Loomis, let's go to you and uh, hear a little bit of your perspectives from the report. Thank you, Chris. Um, so as the, when I was the team doctor for the uh, Cardinals and the Rams, um, asthma was fairly prevalent amongst our, our players. Um, and in fact, it's, it's prevalent in Olympic athletes as well. And the study reported that in 1996, about 20% of the American athletes on the Olympic team had asthma. In fact, it was the most common chronic medical condition present in, in, in U.S. athletes. In the Athens Olympics, 20% uh, of British athletes were reported to, to have um, asthma. And as Chris said earlier, if there's one thing an athlete needs, it's, it's a good deep breath. And so asthma can clearly, uh, it, it clearly can be detrimental to performance. And there's pretty clear evidence that, I mean, there's very clear evidence that, that, that dairy consumption contributes to um, asthma in both children and adults. Um, cow's milk allergy is the most common food allergy in children, um, and it can lead to things like wheezing and cough and GI uh, distress. And in fact, cow's milk allergy can persist in, into adulthood and in fact may be more prevalent in adults than, than, than children. We also know that um, children with asthma, um, about 45% of children with asthma have these chronic um, uh, dairy allergies along with other food allergies. We also know that um, um, dairy can directly cause, uh, uh, cause, cause asthma because asthma is really a chronic inflammatory condition. And it's, the, it's diets that are high in saturated fat, which are associated with asthma. And what's the most common source of dairy, uh, of, of saturated fat in the, in the standard American diet? It's dairy. We also know that, that on, the, on the other side of that coin, the diets that are high in, that are anti-inflammatory, high in fruits and vegetables, um, can actually improve lung performance and, and have been shown to prevent asthma. So, you know, this idea that dairy is somehow some kind of a performance enhancer and, and, and is a great recovery uh, drink is just false. Um, and I think that, that it, you know, again, if you value a good deep breath, ditching dairy uh, is the way to go. I, I was a collegiate athlete. I ran track in college. I had exercise-induced asthma. I drank milk. Um, fast forward now, I'm an endurance athlete. I, I went off dairy about 10 years ago. And I can tell you my athletic performance now in my 60s is, is just as good, if not better, than it was when I was in my 20s. And, um, you know, again, I haven't had, the, I haven't had any asthma symptoms in, in 10 or 15 years since I ditched dairy. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Loomis. Let's uh, continue the kind of opening remarks here. Uh, Dr. Sadecki, would you mind jumping in? If you wouldn't mind, sorry, Dr. Sadecki, would, would you mind uh, going off mute, please? Thank you. I always tell myself, don't forget to unmute, and I always forget. <laughs> yes, as Dr. Loomis beautifully uh, uh, mentioned, the fact that dairy is being sold and advertised as an, as a, um, as, as an athletic performance enhancement uh, food. Uh, well, I have to tell you that it, Unfortunately, that has created a lot of confusion in athletes and the general population because they would come to me and see me as, their, um, as a doctor who specializes in the health of the gastrointestinal tract and diseases of the digestive uh, tract. And when they come in to see me, I'm telling them otherwise because uh, the dairy is causing them a lot of harm and illness. And they leave confused because they're getting conflicted information and they're being told that this um, uh, fluid is somehow uh, enhancing their performance and yet they're coming to see me and I'm telling them that it's causing digestive disease. So I'm very proud of being part of this report because I believe that it, people have been fed one-sided information for so many years and it's time for us health professionals to step up the plate and clarify that dairy is not health food. And I'll tell you what I mean. Um, when, you know, when, I'll give you an example. When um, I see a patient with colon cancer, um, I might let them know that they should get chemotherapy. Now, when you give someone chemotherapy, such as 
one like oxaloplatin, right? You know that might cause damage. It would cause neuropathy and people can't walk and they get numbness in their hands and feet. But you evaluate the risks and the benefits of this chemotherapy. And sometimes the benefits outweigh the risks. So then you go ahead and recommend it to the patient. So the dairy industry is focused on the fact that dairy has calcium and it has protein. Uh, but unfortunately, they're not advertising the negative and uh, deleterious effects of dairy, which I see in my clinic on a daily basis. There, let's just pretend that, that a thousand uh, athletes are participating in um, the Olympics. I'm, I'm just saying that for the sake of simplicity, there are more, but out of the thousand athletes, statistically 650 of them would have GI disturbances after consuming dairy products. What are those GI disturbances? Those 650 athletes will have diarrhea or constipation or alternating diarrhea and constipation, severe bloating or abdominal distension, nausea or vomiting, hiccups, burping, and excessive flatulence and abdominal pain. That's just when they have lactose intolerance, which means that they're, they're not digesting the dairy product very well because they're missing um, an essential enzyme called lactase in order to break down the dairy. That's not even including the inflammatory products, the inflammatory uh, possibilities that dairy could cause. But just let's just stick to lactose intolerance. Intolerance. 65 to 70 percent of the population have lactose intolerance. In some groups, this the, the statistics jump up to 80 to 90 percent. So when you, it, it's, it's pretty frustrating when I see dairy advertised as health food, because I know that these poor individuals are going to be in my clinic suffering with GI distress. And when we're talking about athletes, I mean, Dotsie uh, talks about how important it is to be, uh, to eat the healthiest diet, you have to be on top of your game. So it's even more important for athletes not to be running to the bathroom every five minutes and having diarrhea and abdominal bloating right before a game. So, so I'm very proud of being a part of this report and thank you so much for including me because I want to be the voice for uh, people who are suffering with gastrointestinal diseases. Thank you so much, Angie. Uh, James, why don't you uh, close us out here with the opening comments, if you would, please. Yeah, I had no idea how amazing this report would be. I'm, I'm so honored to be a part of it. And, and really, as a dietitian who specializes in environmental nutrition and looking at the environment, I have one message to give. And I think many of us agree we are what we eat. But for those consuming animal products like dairy, I challenge everyone listening and beyond to friends and family and, and beyond as much as possible to think about what does your food, what does your food eat? right? So if you're consuming animal products they are eating, what are they consuming? We know that animal products like dairy, especially if they're fatty animal products like whole milk and cheese, they are basically very lipophilic to a lot of these environmental pollutants. They are, uh, these environmental pollutants many times are persistent organic pollutants. We call them POPs. There are also endocrine disrupting chemicals. We call them EDCs. And they are present, we know, in human breast milk, which is why we, we were prompted to look at animal breast milk, which is milk, right? Our, and our food systems and our foodstuffs. So in looking that, we sure enough found them in dairy. And UC Davis did a wonderful study on this, finding various uh, PCBs and PBDEs and all these other acronyms that no one really hears about. And it's quite the alphabet soup in dairy products and other foods. We can also collectively call this dioxins. We now know dioxins, which are byproducts of TVs and remote controls and other industry products, your desk and other plastics and make their way into our foods and really love fat in our foods and we'll stick to those fats and then get inside of us. All this to say, we need more research in this area. We need to look at these effects. We need to be aware of these effects and really, again, go back to that question, what is my food's food? Is that cow living a quality life if I'm going to eat that cow or consume that cow's breast milk? And, and as I'm closing, I just wanna read you know, this is from the official publication of the Association of American Feed Control Officials. This is what is allowed in the feed of animals like cows. So we allow meat meal, meat uh, meal tankage, meat and bone meal, poultry, poultry meal, 
meat byproducts, dried animal blood, blood meal, feather meal, uh, we dying and disease and disabled animals that are ground up and then added. Um, so we also allow animal waste, so that's ruminants from their intestines, feces, and many, many more. That is just the beginning of that list. So we really have to question what is going on here, and we need to bring this awareness to a bigger audience. Thank you all so much. Who's hungry? <laughs> um, some chocolate milk. Sounds great right now. <laughs> In, indeed, indeed. So we are, um, again, uh, getting near to the Q&A portion here. Really want to invite you all to uh, don't be shy and, and let us know um, uh, how we can best serve uh, your questions today. Um, again, the Q&A function there at the bottom of your screen is the path for the uh, questions. Um, maybe I'll just kind of get us started with one question off the bat here, which is, you know, Un un undoubtedly, um, each of you have participated in, in lots of different uh, scientific studies uh, and research projects uh, over your careers. Um, could you each just reflect for a minute, it, was there one thing that really surprised you in the findings in this final publication that really kind of stuck out that you, perhaps you yourself learned something new in, in the journey here? Um, and and Dotsie, since you kind of drove the ship here from the beginning, maybe I'll start with that question with you. Uh, I did not know nearly enough about what uh, all James was just speaking about. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I barely knew anything. I really just knew mostly about uh, the, the fluid that came from the cow as it relates to um, the macronutrients, the micronutrients, um, and then the inflammatory properties uh, that cow's milk gets off and, and the sugars, uh, D-galactose also um, any U5GC, as well as IGF-1, which promotes growth, which we don't want uh, in adulthood because we don't want our cancer cells growing. Um, but I didn't have any real uh, deep dive into the um, environmental consequences, and I, I can't even uh, imagine repeating <laughs> all that he just gave us, but that was, that was the most surprising to me and, and, and gave me a whole another layer of reasons why uh, people would not consume cow's milk. Um, let's, before you each pile on there, um, we actually, that uh, is a great tie to, the, to a question that just came in um, from Alexander. Um, James, would you mind repeating the source and the quote on the byproducts of the feed given to animals? Uh, I think that's just an ask for you to run through that again and, and provide the source if you would, please. Sure. It's, there's so many acronyms. So I, I have it here just so I, I didn't get it wrong. It's the Association of American Feed Control Officials. And they are basically, they're not nonprofit, but they put out an annual report on the feed and they help with feed regulation, at least in the United States. But, you know, with other first world countries following similar practices, and they basically, this is what is essentially, and I'm looking at it right here, animal feed ingredients that are legally used in US animal feeds. And this list is a mile long, what I described are, are not even some of the worst things on here. Another one is polyethylene roughage replacement, which is essentially a plastic. So they do allow even plastics in animal feed. So feel free to look that up. I, I would recommend everyone to look into this because it's quite atrocious. Excellent. Thank you for that clarification and for making somehow that all seem now even worse than the first time you said it. Um, uh, actually, another question, it looks like maybe perhaps Dr. Sandecki, a question for you. Um, this is, um, I, I'm just going to read this verbatim. I struggle with um, keratosis pilaris as well as scalp plaques. I've been told that there is no cure for either. However, in the last few weeks, I've been fully whole foods plant-based and seen significant improvement. Um, is there anything that I should still be avoiding food-wise or that I should be eating more of to support further improvements? You know, I, I'm, dermatology is definitely not my field of expertise. I'm a gastroenterologist, but um, there are some associations with skin diseases and uh, dairy consumption. One of them is eczema, the other one is acne. I am not um, aware of keratosis. Dr. Loomis, you may know the answer to this. No, so many people think that that's a, it's kind of a normal variant of skin. So what happens is you get this really dry skin and little bumps. There is some evidence that, um, um, uh, you know, any, I, I, I'm back to Chris's original question. You know what, I think 
what I'm struck by by all this is is the role that inflammation plays in many of these chronic diseases and and dairy being a very pro-inflammatory compound. There is evidence that actually uh, increasing your omega-3 intake may help with this condition. Um, you can get you can take omega-3 supplements from algae. Um, that's um, a, a, an easy way to take it without getting all the contaminants. Some of the stuff that James talked about in the in the in the stuff we feed cows, we also feed fish now. So it's the same feed actually. Um, but walnuts, hemp seed, um, uh, chia seed, um, uh, flax seed, uh, even green leafy vegetables have, have lots. And that may be in fact why you've seen improvement is that your omega-3 intake has gone up and your omega-6 intake, which are the pro-inflammatory compounds has gone down as you've transitioned to a plant-based diet. And congratulations, by the way, and taking those important steps in improving your health <laughs> overall. Got a, a quick build on that same theme, so I'm just going to kind of layer this on top of it, which uh, 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 reads as an individual has as many of the things we've just been talking about, GI distress, acne, fatigue, and so forth, um, suggestion that uh, the individual quit dairy for a couple of weeks to see if there's an improvement in her health. The question really is, would two weeks be sufficient to show improvement? So duration of time between uh, making a switch and, and seeing improvements, I think, is the heart of that question there. Um, Dr. Loomis, you still have the unmute button on, so yeah. perhaps you can kick us off there. So, you know, I think most definitely you can see some short-term improvements, especially, again, in inflammation, asthma, things like that. Um, if you've got lactose intolerance, many people have, as, as, as Dr. Sadecki already talked about, many people have lactose intolerance and don't even realize it because the symptoms are very subtle, you know, gas and a little bloating and diarrhea. Um, we also know that dairy can, can lead to a disrupted gut microbiome. And again, Dr. Secchi can speak to this better than I, but that may in fact take a little bit longer to, to, to kind of reset your gut microbiome. And that's highly dependent on how disrupted that is. And that depends on you know, chronic antibiotic exposure. Um, there's antibiotic residues in, in meat and dairy, which uh, can affect our gut microbiome. And that can sometimes take a little bit longer, but certainly you can see some pretty uh, significant short-term improvements, especially if there's an element of, 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 uh, of lactose intolerance, which is very common, and, and uh, in breathing as well. Let, let's see how, how common that lactose intolerance is. Uh, Molly, would you mind um, publishing our next poll, please, if you would? And uh, while uh, that is coming up, um, let's get into um, a little bit of uh, kind of uh, advice for those looking for alternatives. And Dati, maybe I'll, I'll come to you first. I'm sure we all can uh, pile on to this one. Um, looking for some you know, alternatives, particularly those that may uh, help with calcium. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, dark leafy greens, for sure. Uh, and, and I think before I even list some of the foods, it's important to recognize that uh, the calcium found in cow's milk is only about 30% uh, bioavailable in the human body. And uh, all of these other foods, these, uh, these leafy greens, almonds, sesame seeds, tahini that have the highest forms of calci calcium are about 60% bioavailable, which means we are actually taking up that calcium, digesting it, and is able to get to our bones uh, and other parts of our body. So um, if you love big cruciferous salads, that's your calcium. But if you have a kiddo who's you're like, oh, sure, Dotsie, let me just give them a bowl of kale and say, have at it. Um, I say, have tahini. That really is the, the highest source of calcium. And they can just dip their carrot sticks, celery, chips, whatever it is, into the tahini, and um, you're good to go. I'll, I'll add to that as well. I mean, yeah, when it comes to kids and families, it's, it's taste, texture, and temperature. So you'd be surprised. I have to share our five-year-old daughter has been eating kale since she was three years old. And we just do it in different ways. You can add kale in your lasagna. You can add, of course, it's non-dairy lasagna, but adding kale in there, you can blend it up in a soup. You can, you can do it many different ways when you're messing around with taste, texture, and temperature. On top of that, we have to remember many foods, especially dairy foods, are additionally fortified with calcium after production, 
or, or in that production process. So many of these things that we think, oh yeah, they're, they're dairy, they have calcium, they've been fortified additionally with calcium. So on top of that, it, you can also find a wonderful vegan calcium supplement. Many of them are, are whole food based. So they're based out of seaweed with high amounts of calcium that you can add to your plant milks and just fortify your, your own milk with a better quality calcium supplement. Yeah, and another great source of calcium is uh, tofu. Um, tofu, tofu, as you may know, is just bean curd. So you take soy milk and you curdle it and you scrape the curds off and, and press it into a block. And, and historically, the curdling agent is gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. And so some of that calcium stays in the tofu, excellent source of calcium. And as Dati said, collard greens is probably the second best from a green leafy vegetable standpoint. But, and so tofu is something else you can sometimes uh, give to kids if you hide it well enough. <laughs> Let's, let's do let's do one more uh, question that's here uh, and there we go look at that uh, 50 percent on the call uh, as lactose intolerant um, let's uh, let's let's stay just one last time uh, uh, in this in this category of, of alternatives and uh, food recommendations um, we've got a question here from uh, Joe um, which if there is a recommendation from a nutrition perspective on uh, various milk alternatives, so uh, almonds or oats or others, um, is there a nutritional benefit uh, among those uh, alternatives? And um, can you clarify the assumption about soy uh, being bad for you? Uh, and that was in quotes. Uh, so James, perhaps I'll go to you first uh, to kick us off there. Yeah, I mean, I'll start from a scientific perspective. I mean, soy, when you talk about superfoods, I'm not a, I'm not a huge believer in calling everything a superfood. It doesn't have to be from this exotic faraway place. Soy is, I would say, is a superfood. It's, it's amazing when it comes to protein. It has a lot of phytonutrients, many of which can be retained in soy milk. So you are getting a powerhouse if you're drinking soy milk. I think a lot of the, there is some concern with genetically modified soy and other, other forms of soy, but overall, when you're talking about the nutrition value with soy milk, I think it's great. Some of the fears may be coming from the whole misconception that soy boosts estrogen levels when really soy has phytoestrogen. So phytoestrogen has been found in multiple studies to you know, uh, adhere to estrogen receptors and actually help balance estrogen levels, whereas estradiol and animal-based estrogens, which are active forms, and I know Dr. Sadegi and Dr. Loomis can add to this, but um, you know, it's actually animal products will contain active forms of estrogen, and that's where you're more likely to get estrogen, not from soy. But yeah, I know Dr. Loomis or Dr. Say can add to that for sure. I mean, that's, that's exactly Dr. Loomis, right. if, uh, Dr. Loomis, if you want, just a, a build on the question, just as you, if you can inter incorporate it into your answer, um, a question about, uh, how can we correct this myth that we were just, uh, James was just talking about? Um, are there ways, there's an individual that is uh, sending folks to nutritionfacts.org. Are there any other referral sources or other myth busting sources besides of course, switchforgood.org that right. you would recommend uh, uh, promoting? Well, I was gonna say that I heard there's this great report coming out <laughs> that needs to be shared with everybody. Uh, my organization, PCRM, has some excellent resources um, uh, specifically around soy and dairy and, and such. That's another great resource. Uh, but, but just what James said is exactly right. Um, the phytoestrogens in, in uh, soy actually weakly bind to the estrogen receptor and block the effect of estrogen um, and, and has been shown in multiple studies to uh, so it lowers the risk actually of breast cancer and in women who had breast cancer it, it increases survival and, and lowers the risk of, of um, recurrence um, and, and and again as James said there's there's uh, we also risk overexposure to estrogen from the dairy because we in and, and the hormones that that are given to cows and pigs and chickens to, to promote growth and, and things like that which can have an adverse effect as well kind of the environment some of the environmental nutrition that James talked about early on in his introduction and, and I would add to that, you know, to further answer the milk, like which milk is best, I just try and look the most bang for your buck. What milk is going to give you the most? What's going to give you the vitamins, the minerals, and the macronutrients, and the phytonutrients? You know, some of my favorites, like I said, soy, hemp, I, I'd probably say are my top two. Soy and hemp milk are some of the most nutritious milks out there. And, uh, and yeah, very tasty. 
a slight build here, and I, I think it's an interesting question um, from uh, from Kathy, um, who uh, drank milk uh, and it was like water uh, when she was a kid, uh, a little a little while ago. Um, has milk changed since then? Have we seen a change in the industry? Perhaps James, you can build on this. Dotsy, I know you have a point of view as well. How has the milk industry added to or changed its product over time as a way to continue to propagate its its myth? Well, I'll take this from the agricultural perspective uh, and then feel if anyone can add on definitely. But, you know, I think a lot of the milk cartons or the milk companies have that picture of the family farm and it looks beautiful and it's green and you see the old farmer there and they're, they're hanging out with a cow and it's this beautiful thing. I think over the last 40 years, we've really seen that change. We've really seen big, you know, industrial companies come in and really make it really make these CAFOs, which is concentrated animal feeding operations, happen where it's not on this small family farm with this nice little family milking the cow. That's just not the case. So that's been a huge change where we've added a lot of risk. And in that risk has come from, you know, uh, pathogens in the animals. So we have to give them more antibiotics where 80% of our antibiotics are now going to livestock. There's rodents and other pests, so then you have to add more rodenticide. You have to feed them more, which is why we're you know, adding to this list of horrible ingredients in which we're feeding these cows to save money. So it just, you know, one bad decision leads to another, and we've really seen that shift happen in the last 40 to 50 years. So that's been something huge that's been changing, and it, it only seems to be getting worse and worse, which is why you all need to read this scientific report and really get the word out there and really say, whoa, we need to make some drastic changes for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have one layer to add to that because I also saw that there was a question that someone had just about like all animal milks in general. Uh, they were specifically talking about cow's milk because it's about what 99% of uh, the population in the world consumes when it comes to other mammalian milks. Um, so whole cow's milk, if we were just going to talk macronutrients, is about uh, 22 percent protein, 48 uh, percent fat, and 30 percent carbohydrate. And by comparison, human breast milk is 7 percent protein, 49 percent fat, of which almost none is saturated fat and is a very high level of saturated fat in the 48 percent cow's milk. And human milk, 44 percent carbohydrate, which just helps us to even just that picture alone shows us that the, that humans are supposed to be eating a low fat, high carbohydrate, medium amount of protein diet. That's, that's what our breast milk is literally made of. So I think the, the, you know, the larger point too is that any animal milk is just simply not made for us. So. Shift gears just slightly here. Uh, Dr. Sadeki, a question for you, I believe, um, coming uh, from a, uh, as a, as a preteen, uh, uh, somebody was diagnosed with an allergy to milk protein. Um, uh, question is, uh, how prevalent is that uh, condition? Uh, if you would talk just about the prevalence of, of allergies uh, uh, at all ages, but particularly for, for kids. Yeah. I, I'm very GI centric, so I'm going to answer this question uh, in regards to the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, there is a condition called eosinophilic esophagitis, and studies have shown that uh, dairy is the most commonest causes of uh, the inflammation that we encounter in the esophagus, which prohibits individuals from being able to have normal swallowing. Uh, the stomach, uh, the, I'm sorry, the esophagus, which is the tube that's connected to your mouth that basically through peristaltic action sends the food down to your stomach, this tube hardens, and uh, it becomes full infiltrated by these eosinophils, which are allergic white cells that attack the esophagus because uh, of this allergy to the whey or the casein uh, protein in milk. So um, when someone has eosinophilic esophagitis, one of the first things we ask them to avoid is dairy. And indeed, I've seen, um, I'm diagnosing so many uh, athletes uh, who are consuming whey products, whey protein powders. Um, so many athletes. I have seen about at least one patient come in. Um, they're football players or um, basketball players or any types of athletes who come in and they can't swallow. And I look at, look at them and I immediately ask them if they're consuming whey protein powders. 
uh, sure enough, they are. And um, I do their endoscopy proof that they have this inflammatory condition. Um, and it's, it's called the eosinophilic esophagitis, esophagitis. I asked them to go on a strict dairy-free diet and indeed their problem resolves most of the time. So yes, it is, it can, dairy can be a very inflammatory food um, product um, that affects the, the, negatively affects the GI tract in particular in the case of eosinophilic esophagitis. Just to, just to build on that that's come up and, and uh, I think it kind of really gets to the heart of this report itself because it is um, uh, this combination of over marketing to uh, hype a trend or a fad, particularly in, in the way uh, category in the fitness industry that is certainly abundantly true um, question and I think this can maybe an open one um, are, are, are the panelists um, concerned or predicting about increases in cancer or other detrimentous uh, health impacts because of the over prevalence of whey um, in the fitness industry in particular I think the question I, specifically you know, is a cancer concern just to be clear yeah so you know the the um I think it's hard to attribute a single nutrient um, as a causative factor for these very complex diseases, right? We know that we we know that um, uh, there's a lot of things that contribute to cancer risk. One of them, in fact, though, is the overconsumption of of protein, and it does seem that dairy proteins seem to have a, a greater risk. And, and some people think it's because of the higher prevalence of methylated amino acids. So amino acids, so proteins are made up of a, strings of amino acids. And when we, when we consume protein, it's actually broken down into, our, into the individual amino acids, which are absorbed in our body, and then we reassemble them to meet whatever our body's needs are. And it, and it, does, seem to, it, it does seem that um, um, the, the, high, the more highly methylated uh, proteins, uh, amino acids, may have a greater propensity to damage DNA. Uh, there was a study in, I think, cell metabolism a number of years ago that showed that in men um, who, who overconsumed animal-based proteins compared to plant-based proteins, their risk for diabetes, cancer, heart disease markedly, markedly increased. Um, and, and so that's, that's one of the theories. Um, and so it has to do with the makeup of the amino acids of, of, the, of the proteins um, that, that, we have, that we have. The other factor that some people think is causative is um, the propensity of, of, of some of these proteins to stimulate IGF-1 uh, production. IGF-1 is, a, uh, is an anabolic um, 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 compound we make that helps, that helps cells grow. And obviously, uh, we don't want to stimulate cancer cells to grow. And, and so it's the association between dairy products and IGF-1 uh, production and animal proteins in general, dairy, and then IGF-1 has also been, uh, has been proposed as one of the reasons that uh, meat and dairy may, in fact, increase your risk for certain kinds of cancer. I would also like to touch on, I mean, this goes back to, I mean, there's wonderful organizations, IARC, IARC, uh, you know, WHO, helping us classify these carcinogens that we're identifying. And so to give just an analogy, imagine a glass of water. And at the end of the day, you have to drink this glass of water. But all throughout the day, you've been putting your exposures in that glass of water. So you got you were walking on the street and a big car exhaust plume of smoke went in your face or someone smoking a cigarette or there's some contaminant in your drinking water or you know you were exposed to a certain pesticide as a gardener was going by spraying something we're constantly being exposed to these environmental toxins all around us and again i'm not trying to fear monger whatsoever this is just the reality and again they're, they're tiny exposures but what happens if we imagine you're adding these little tiny exposures to this glass of water, who at the end of the day would willingly go, yeah, let me drink that glass of water. But as it adds up throughout the day, we just don't think about it, right? So my point here is when you're consuming animal products like the fatty breast milk of another mammal, dairy, right? You are consuming a, a, a bioaccumulation of these chemicals, right? So, so these chemicals, over 200, were found in human breast milk, which is why we started looking at animal products and we started, and the FDA and the CDC has been looking into other food products. Um, so can you imagine, I, I mean, I think we'd all agree that humans live a healthier and cleaner life than a dairy cow, right? So imagine what exposure and what's, what is the cow is being exposed to 
on that farm, right? What kind of water is it, is it drinking? We, we've seen just a glimpse of the kind of food it's eating. So we can only imagine how much exposure that, that is, you know, is coming into contact with that cow. Um, and this all goes back to the gut microbiome as well, because we have something called the exposome, which is a buffer system. Our, our gut microbiome protects us from these environmental exposures. And we're gonna be seeing the research exploding on this in the next five to 10 years of actually seeing, wow, our, our microbes actually help protect us from a lot of these heavy metals and plastic byproducts, but they can only do so much. It's just like that video game where your force field runs out, especially if you are over consuming these animal products. So very, very important stuff to think about. James, you're not off the hook yet, sir. Um, uh, just a quick, uh, a quick build uh, on that. Um, can you reflect just based on where you think the trend are? You just said we're about to see the research explode. There's a question here on um, how can we or do we think that this information, particularly about dioxin exposure and the uptake there, will be more available and present in university programs? Your thoughts on how we may be able to take collective action to help change that to make sure that it is. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I, I think it, it definitely will be just in the last, I mean, just me being more aware of it in the last five years, you know, I think it's, I've been seeing these studies come out since 2017, more and more coming out in 2020, when I go, which is rare and I have a lot of free time, but, you know, I'm, I'm the nerd that's on PubMed in my free time, just looking up what's new in environmental nutrition. I get the email alerts and I'm seeing more and more studies, especially surprisingly coming out of China. China is really, really concerned about this. So I think the universities in China will be spearheading a lot of this because as you know, China has a pollution problem. So they're looking for solutions to fix these pollution problems. And as they're researching, they're going, oh my gosh, our fish is contaminated. Oh my gosh, our, our cows are contaminated, our soil's contaminated. And they're really just open up the, the Pandora's box into all of this. So I think definitely the research coming out of China will be big and we're, we're seeing that wave come. And I think it's only a matter of time before everyone else catches on and goes, wow, we really need to look at this. And then as far as building it into curriculum, that can take some time, but we all have to demand that for sure. Great, thank you uh, for that, James. Uh, amazingly, we are at uh, the 10 minute warning here. So uh, let's keep this uh, going, try to get as many of these questions in as we can. Um, Dr. Sandecki, back to you. Um, can dairy cause autoimmune diseases because of the negative effects it has on the GI tract and the microbiome? Oh boy. Um, there has never been a direct link um, as far as an autoimmune disease with dairy that I'm aware of. I, you should ask a rheumatologist that question. I, uh, but there is a study that uh, showed that when it comes to ulcerative colitis, um, that is, um, it's an infl inflammatory condition of the um, colon, uh, that people who consume dairy can uh, worsen their disease. Um, Dr. Loomis, are you aware of a uh, autoimmune disease that uh, ha is there a direct link? Well, I, I can tell you in my clinical practice, um, I see patients reverse, improve, and I don't, I don't want to call it reverse, but, but put into remission. Um, um, autoimmune diseases every day, um, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, eczema, you know, asthma is kind of an of a autoimmune disease, if you will. And I, and I think it's a combination of two things. Um, the, you know, I think about, if you think about the human body as a house, we have different rooms in our house, right? So we have a brain room, a gut room, a joint room, skin room, respiratory room. And when we fill our house up with angry people, um, and, and, and strangers wander into the house, it's not a good outcome. Depending on the nature of the stranger and what room they come into depends on the clinical state, right? So they come in the thyroid room, you get thyroiditis. They come in the brain room, you get uh, multiple sclerosis. They come in the skin room, you get eczema or, as, or, or, or um, psoriasis. You come in the joint room, you get rheumatoid arthritis. Where are these strangers? So where are these angry people coming from? It's the highly inflammatory Western diet. And it's a combination of uh, of, of omega-6, omega-3 ratios above the optimal kind of three to one range. We're talking, you know, standard American diet, 10 to 50 to one. And then the lack of antioxidant capacity, um, which, which we need antioxidants to combat the inflammation that comes from oxidative stress that's created as part of our normal metabolism. And, and, and I think that there's, there's emerging evidence that some of these strangers, where they're coming from, is they're coming in through, through the gut, that we, you know, we developed this, this gut dysbiosis, 
Um, you know, I, I don't really like the word leaky gut per se, but we know that, that, that gut micro, that, as you know, the gut microbiome helps maintain gut integrity. And when that gets disrupted, we start to leak some of these protein antigens that come from our food. Some of these environmental toxins like bacteria and, and viruses that we consume every day. Um, um, but now have entryway into, into our house, if you will. And, and I think that's why a whole food plant-based diet is so important because not only do you, so when you lower that omega-6, omega-3 ratio back into the two to one, three to one range, you increase your antioxidant capacity. You kick all those angry people out and replace them with people listening to Mozart and drinking green tea. Um, and then it takes a little bit longer, but then you shut the front door. Um, when you heal your gut microbiome. So the strangers, there may be a stranger that wanders in every now and then, but now you, you're, the, the people in the house aren't angry anymore. So you don't develop this profound inflammatory response. Um, and, and again, I, I see this, I see it every single day, uh, uh, frankly, um, people having dramatic improvement in these chronic autoimmune diseases um, after they transition to a plant-based diet. Yeah, I have to add to that. We, we see that every day too, Dr. Sadegi and I, and that, and that term you're looking for is the gut permeability, right? Or what we call leaky gut, but yeah. it is this gut permeability that happens and we're seeing this mucosal layer break down from people just choosing poor lifestyle habits, right? So it, what's, what's funny enough is this mucosal layer in the gut is like this sticky goo and it's, it's essentially made from carbohydrates. Who knew carbohydrates could protect you, but we're, we're not talking about eating cookies and cake, you know, those, those bad carbs, right? We're talking about whole food plant-based diet with healthy complex carbohydrates and fiber that help protect this mucosal lining and properly feed your gut microbiome and protect this barrier. So you're not getting that permeability, then you're not overstimulating your immune system, and then it leads to this snowball effect of, of horrible symptoms. So yeah, it's really important to protect your gut lining. Yeah, and that's another area, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier, I, I think that uh, you, in the medical literature every day, there's new research being published around, around gut microbiome and autoimmunity, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, you know, ulcerative colitis, um, et cetera. It's really fascinating stuff. Dr. I'm gonna come, come your way here for the next question. Um, and, and I know it took a lot to publish this report, so hold on to your chair for a second. But the question is, um, this report was overdue and, and a major step forward. Do we know of upcoming reports that will address specific target markets like cheese, ice cream, and yogurt? I think the request here is for you to get back to the, back to the table here and get to work on a follow-up report specifically <laughs> targeting those items. But um, just curious, it, it, just take the question more broadly. Um, now that we've completed this report, um, what will Switch for Good be looking to do next as it uh, continues to be a disruptive force in tearing down some of these false facts that we've been told for too long? Yeah, oh, thanks for that question. So we're working from uh, <clears throat> all uh, areas of um, killing dairy. <laughs> um, from a policy standpoint, from a governmental policy standpoint, as it relates to the dietary guidelines, um, and the Department of Health and Human Services um, in, in, in getting dairy off of our uh, dietary guidelines for Americans and offering a alternative in schools uh, for children. Uh, we also have um, programs that have been a little halted during COVID, uh, but they're programs with professional sports teams. The first one that we did was with the LA Clippers, um, going in and helping them to understand all the deleterious effects of of cow's milk and uh, helping them to uh, have alternatives and change over their, their diet with their chefs. And this report is going to uh, professional sports teams, university and college athletic directors, uh, many different types of doctor's offices. So we're basically really just getting started uh, with the work that we're gonna do with this report alone. Um, and Switch for Good also has a research arm, which was also halted by COVID, um, but uh, we are, we did a pilot study last year, very small pilot study, but we are going to be doing a large scale study um, on uh, the inflammatory markers as it relates to high fat cow's milk versus high fat soy milk at Chapman University uh, that was so, supposed to start this, this spring, um, but you know, couldn't because can't, you can't take blood from anyone. So our research arm is going to continue to grow because I'm, I'm very determined uh, to make sure that we get uh, studies and information out there as it relates to, you know, not only health, which we have plenty, a lot of, in relation to animal foods versus plant-based foods, 
but we don't have a lot in the performance category. So we need to be pushing, uh, pushing that limit as well. Fantastic. We are, we are, uh, go ahead, James, were you going to jump in there? I was, I just, cause you mentioned for cheese and cheese and ice cream. But what I always tell my patients really quick is I know a lot, a lot of the research is done on milk, right? A lot of the focus is put on milk, but really what cheese and ice cream are is just, you take all the fat from milk, you coagulate it together, whether you're adding a bunch of salt or you're adding a bunch of sugar and you call that cheese or you call that ice cream. So really, if anything, milk and cheese is just adding and compounding the deleterious effects of milk and just really concentrating it into a nice little block for you. So yeah, it's, it's, it's still bad, really bad. <laughs> um, thank you, sir. The good, uh, great clarification. Um, sadly, we are, we are quickly running out of time here. So I wanna end with a, a, a final question and I'm gonna pose it to each of you. So this is one of those scenarios where it's gonna be good to go last to get a little bit more time to, to think your answer. Um, the, the report is, is uh, an amazing report, but it's 48 pages. Not a lot of people are going to sift through all of that. Um, what would be your elevator pitch, 30 seconds or less, of why dairy is bad? And I'm going to combine that with a, another question uh, from somebody who indicated they are not lactose intolerant and not an athlete who also wanted to know the pitch on why dairy is bad. So 30 seconds, elevator pitch why dairy is bad. And sorry, Dotsy, you carry the title of executive director. So this is coming to you first to let our guests a little bit more time. Sure. Um, so the Dairy Does a Body Bad report shows that cow's milk has serious negative effects on general health, is an underlying factor in numerous chronic diseases. Dairy is a specific impediment uh, to athlete performance and uh, professional athletes' health. And dairy is the most heavily marketed and subsidized food group in the United States Department of Agriculture. There's associations between dairy consumption and chronic disease, cancers and asthma, even Parkinson's disease. Um, there is a history of dairy marketing tactics that are exploiting and targeting athletes uh, in an untrue, unfair, uh, very biased way. Um, and uh, I think very importantly to mention lastly is how dairy disproportionately sickens people of color. I think that might have been 30 seconds. And I want to say, we're going to make you a video whoever you are <laughs> in about a 60 seconds. So, so that you can just like send that on to, to your peeps, but you can always send your, 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 uh, these people, the introduction to the report, which is one page before, until we have that video made for you. Fantastic. I'm going to, we have time for one more answer there. And then um, before anybody leaves the call, please don't drop off right as we wrap up, you're going to get a, a window pop up on your screen. And it's going to get you immediate access to the report and the ability to take Dotsie's challenge to send it off to your friends and family. Um, I, whoever would like to take the, the last 30 seconds, Dr. Loomis, you unmuted first, go for it. So, you know, I, I make this, I think this is very simple, actually. Um, I like to think of, of human nutrition through the lens of our evolutionary biology. Um, you know, we've, we are not designed to drink other mammals' milk, right? What is milk? It's a biologic fluid that evolves species specific to take, facilitate baby mammals turning into mammals big enough to find food on their own. And once that happens, we don't need our mother's milk anymore. That's why you don't see mother, human milk on the grocery store shelf, right? So the idea that we should be somehow benefiting from another mammal's milk that evolved to facilitate a 70 pound cow turn into a 700 pound cow makes absolutely no sense. And as Dotsie has already said, there's a, there's a plethora of, of medical issues with a, which, which are associated with, with dairy. Furthermore, we had to domesticate other mammals to get access to their milk. When did that happen? Seven to 8,000 years ago. Very recent addition to our nutritional repertoire for almost all of human history. The only milk we had available was our mother's milk. And, 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 and so again, I think if you just look at it clearly through the lens of our evolutionary biology, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that, that, there, that we should be consuming other mammalian milk. I think it's pretty simple, frankly. Uh, sadly, we must, uh, we must come to a close. Um, great energy, uh, perfect uh, conversation, uh, covered a lot of ground. Uh, Dr. Loomis, Dr. Sadecki, uh, Mr. Marin, Dotsie, of course. Thank you so much for your time and energy. Dotsie, did you have a few final remarks before we go? Oh, you know, just share the report, everyone. We're just getting started. So thank you so much to our tribe basically out there uh, that joined us today. And uh, please do share the report and stay tuned because we're gonna have uh, some more coming your way. Thanks for, thanks for being here.
And with that, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of the afternoons and evenings. Stay safe, stay sane out there. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.